Hopefully you can hear us all right. We're here in the greenhouse with Tim Krosig. He is going to be talking, uh, answering a couple of different questions. Uh, and, oh, there we go. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Just in case you're joining, we're here at Lion Arboretum in our uh, greenhouse with Tim Krosig. I'm Hadley Anderson, the education specialist. Tim is our horticulture horticulturalist and our greenhouse manager. And he's going to be answering a couple of questions that we got from our audience to, uh, this week. And he's going to be talking a little bit about water quality. So thanks, Tim. Thanks for joining us today. Yeah, sure. Happy to be here. Greetings, all you green thumbs out here. Thanks for uh, tuning in today to learn a little bit more about how to better care for your plants and, and grow that green thumb of yours. Excellent. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. We got a couple of questions from our audience members. Tim, you've already been able to see some of these, so I'm just going to go ahead and read them, right? Okay, sure. All right, Fire so, away. <laughs> dear Tim, what's been eating my kale, and is there anything I can do to protect it in the future? And it features a picture of some dinosaur kale that looks like little pieces have been cut out of it. Right, so it looks pretty lacy like that. Um, the first thing that I would think of is that it's probably a Lepidopteran damage or a caterpillar damage. And so that would be the larva of a butterfly or a moth. And most typically for brassicas or the mustard family, mm -hmm. which is what kale is in, it's going to be the cabbage loop or moth larva oh, that's going to create yeah the damage like that so you see the pretty uh white to yellowish butterfly looking insects flying around your garden yep um they're pretty cool to look at and they're kind of pretty but they do a lot of damage in their larval stage to your plant so kind of once they've honed in mm -hmm. on your garden and they know that it's a food source they're gonna come back so ideally, once you have damage that's at that scale, mm -hmm. you're probably going to want to remove your kale plant and, and let it have a break for a little while. Let it okay. go fallow from your brassicas. So that's where crop rotation mm -hmm. is key. But if you can catch the infestation early enough, then you can spray pesticides to help control the larval stage of that pest insect. Okay. Um, and so there's natural products like neem or mm -hmm. mineral oil that'll help kind of as a preventative spray. Um, and then there's also things that once you do have caterpillars on your plants, you can apply, it's called Bacillus thuringiensis. And it's actually a type of bacteria mm -hmm. that messes with the function of the gut of some of these Lepidopterans. So it's very specific to caterpillars um, and it, it just it messes, up, messes them up and it, it hopefully will provide some relief to your plant and eliminate some of those caterpillar populations that are decimating your kale. Okay, awesome. Thank you, Tim. Sure. Uh, also, if anybody has any questions while we're doing our broadcast, please feel free to chime in um, and we'll look it up <laughs> for that. Our next question, okay. Dear Tim, I live in uh, New Valley. Mm -hmm. where it can get very hot and dry. What would be ideal as a low maintenance ground cover as I am looking to replace my front lawn? Is there something native I could use? Okay, so yeah, when we're talking about the leeward sides of the island, we're looking for something that's what we call xerophytic, meaning that it needs, you know, little irrigation, definitely some to first get the plants established, mm -hmm. but we want something that's gonna kind of survive on its own, do okay throughout the dry season. And, and be efficient as far as water use, which is something we want to be aware of, you know. So um, for ground covers, there are a variety of different things uh, that you can utilize in your area and on the leeward sides of the island. Um, I would recommend using natives. Uh, there are a number of different native morning glories um, that are sufficient at covering the ground and that also are adapted to these drier xerophytic environments. So Pa'u Hi'iaka is one of them. The scientific name is Jacomantia sandwichensis. And there are another, a number of other ones. Pohuehue is another one. Ipomoea pescapre is the scientific name. And those are vining ground covers. 
Another one that's nice that has little yellow flowers is Nanea. I believe you guys had some growing in your children's garden for is a that, short while. Is that known as the beach pea? Beach pea, yes. yep, that's okay, it. They're super cute, yeah, I really like those. They right, cool. and then one that we utilize up here at Lion, but also does well in drier environments is the Ilie, Ooh. which is a plumbago. It has mm. nice white flowers, it's a pollinator plant. And again, it's kind of a creeping, vining sort of ground cover. So not your traditional, you know, really nicely maintained lawn, really uniform, mm -hmm. but it's gonna cover the ground and it's gonna be efficient as far as water use. And it's gonna provide habitat for other organisms, potentially pollinators and beneficial insects. Excellent, if you love the plumbo go. Yes. <laughs> awesome, okay, so I had a, another question. Dear Tim, do you know of any vines that flower, can tolerate hot and dry areas, and do not attract ants? That oh, I could plant yeah. my garden. Uh, this person lives in Palolo. Okay. Um, let's see. Let's start off with vines that can handle drier environments mm -hmm. and that flower. So again, going with the natives, there are a number of native Hawaiian vines in the pea family, Fabaceae. Mm -hmm that could potentially be suitable for your environment. A Viki Viki is one of them. It has a really beautiful pinkish to purple colored pea flowers. Um, it grows quite vigorously in drier environments. Um, another vine that I would potentially recommend uh, is the Thunbergia, the Indian clock vine, which is something mm. that we have up here. It's not a native species. Um, but it does thrive in fairly um, low moisture areas and, uh, and it produces beautiful pendant flowers mm -hmm. that are really nice. So we'll have some of those available up here at Lion. Uh, another vine that I'm thinking of that also produces very fragrant flowers um, is going to be the Paklana. And that is also, even though it has a Hawaiian name, it is a non-native species. Mm -hmm. um, I can't remember the scientific name off of the top of my head, but you can pick it up at any local garden store. Um, Stephanotis is another nice one that has very fragrant flowers. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, there are very few plants and even vines in particular that are not gonna attract ants. Um, it's just ants love plants and they love the pests that feed on the plants mm -hmm. and so really you know any plant that you plant that has a root system that potentially can harbor pests that the ants can farm and harvest honeydew from um, are going to be there and are potentially going to be attracted and infest your plant so the main thing is that you put control measures in place for your ants okay. try to get those populations down and then maybe plant something after you've controlled your ant population. But here in Hawaii, in a tropical environment, we have dozens of species of ants that have been introduced. And so it's a constant battle, whether it's in your backyard or in the greenhouse up here. But it's all about staying on top of it and using the appropriate baits and pesticides. Mm -hmm. And then also just preventative measures, making sure that there isn't a particular sugary food source or a protein source that's going to be easy for them to feed off of and flourish. Okay. Excellent. All right. And we got one more question. So good morning, Tim. I've been battling these crazy five knuckle vines here in my Manoa. Uh, many grow up out between boulders and other areas where I cannot dig the root out. Any suggestions other than a blowtorch? <laughs> All right. So she has you, a picture of the Miley Pilau here. Yeah. So thank you for the photo because I don't actually know that vine as five knuckle vine, um, but I do know it as skunk vine is what they call it on the mainland. And we know it here in Hawaii as Miley Pilau. Um, and Pilau means stinky. And if you've ever pulled this vine out, you know that it smells pretty bad and it gets on your hands. Yep. But it is an extremely invasive vine. It does take over areas, it'll strangle your plants, and it is extremely hard to control. We're constantly battling it up here at Lion. It likes wet environments. You're in Manoa, 
it's a similar environment to Lion. Unfortunately, you know, there isn't any silver bullet to kill off this really invasive weed, but you can utilize a few different things in your tool belt. For one, there's manual removal, and the most effective way to do that is to actually trace the vine all the way back down to the main central root and pull the root out of the ground. If you just break the vine, the root, it's typically has storage reserves in it. It's gonna reshoot new shoots and maybe even be more vigorous than it started off as. So you really wanna trace it all the way back down to the central root mm -hmm. and pull that sucker out of the ground as best as you can. If that isn't effective, then we may wanna utilize herbicides. And so any herbicide with the active ingredient, triclopyr, so one that's commonly used is Garlon. Um, it's a little bit expensive mm -hmm. and it may be hard to find in your general like garden store, but that's gonna be really effective in very small dosages at killing those vines. So first you would probably manually remove as much as you could and then drip just a tiny bit of that Garlon or whatever it is that has triclopyr in it at the base of the stem or the root and that should fairly effectively kill your plant and be very targeted as well. Okay, yeah. Um, finally, they are working on, they as in the USDA, um, APHIS, as well as the Hawaii Department of Agriculture, basically agricultural and entomological experts across the nation have been working on finding a biological control oh. for Miley Pilau because it is so vigorous, it is an agricultural pest, mm -hmm. and overall it causes a lot more harm to our environments than good. So basically they have entomologists or insect scientists going abroad to where this vine naturally occurs, and they're looking for natural pest insects that they could potentially rear out that are very host specific. These insects undergo years and years and years worth of scientific testing to make sure that they're extremely host specific and they only attack the target species that they're um, essentially commissioned to take out. So I believe they do have a couple leads on pest insects from Asia where this vine naturally occurs. And so they're in the process of doing those really rigorous mm -hmm. scientific trials to make sure that if we have this pest insect and we're looking to introduce it, it's not gonna cause any collateral damage, but it's gonna hone in on the Miley Pilau vines and it's hopefully gonna either knock them back or take them out enough that they aren't nearly as much of a problem in agricultural areas as well as in people's backyards. So fingers crossed, those insect scientists can figure that out and we get an effective biological control that we can introduce here in Hawaii. And I know that we have a little bit too many examples of biological controls that weren't as rigorously as rigorously as tested. So, right. okay, you know, it's taking years of research, but I hope it's a comfort that Miley Pilau is not a problem just here, yeah. but all over the place. Yeah, Florida, many <laughs> um, other tropical areas. So. Everyone's yeah. having an issue. Do we have any questions, Jenna, popping up in the feed? No fresh questions. All right, let's go ahead and talk about some water quality and what you have laid out for us over here today, Tim. Sure. So before I jump into water quality, though, I just collected a few samples here of some various diseases and feeding damage that I wanted to go over. So if you're looking to diagnose a pest or disease in your garden, um, you have a little a few rules of thumb that i utilize to diagnose pests and diseases here in our greenhouses at lion so i'm starting off with a hibiscus leaf here and to you know the untrained eye it doesn't look particularly diseased but if you look really closely you can see a bit of a white powdery surface on the upper side of the leaf and so this is actually powdery mildew, and this is a type of fungal disease. Here, we got a light. There you go. You can see it a little bit better. And so it always covers the upper side of the leaf if it's powdery mildew. And if it's on the underside of the leaf, which I don't see anything in this case, 
then it's what we call downy mildew. And those are two different uh, species of fungal pathogens. And so eventually, it looks okay right now, but eventually this will overtake your plant and cause some major damage. So you wanna catch it when it's first infested and treat it with a fungicide appropriately. Neem oil is a good natural fungicide. Jenna has yes? a question. Yeah. Do they ever co-occur? Can you get- They do co-occur, yes. Particularly on cucurbits. If you've ever tried to grow zucchini, or cucumber here in Hawaii, uh, like most of us, you've probably struggled with a variety of pests and diseases. So I have seen, when I've attempted to grow cucumber in the past, powdery mildew on the upper surface of the leaf, downy mildew on the under surface of the leaf. Oh man. And so really, it's about selecting varietals that are resistant to these diseases, but also practicing uh, proper pest and disease management as soon as you detect any problems. So moving on to another uh, fungal disease here. This is a, a ginger leaf and you can see uh, what we call necrosis towards the tip of the leaf which is essentially just dead browning tissue. So it starts at the margin of the leaf and it works its way towards the midrib which is the middle of the leaf there and you often see yellowing along the necrosis and it's what we call generally a radial pattern so it radiates from a central infection point which is usually towards the, the margin of the leaf and it'll be kind of circular where the infection will grow and slowly overtake your leaf and so again there are a variety of different fungal diseases that do this, and there are also nutrient deficiencies that may look like this as well. So, you know, it, it's a little hard to diagnose, but generally, if you see this yellowing and browning on your leaves, sometimes you'll even see fruiting bodies of the fungi or spores, maybe even some orangish patterning, which is actually rust or another type of fungal disease that affects foliage on your plants. And so now jumping over to bacterial diseases, in contrast, you can see that this bacterial disease on this ava leaf looks quite a bit different. It doesn't start from the margin of the leaf, but it actually will kind of start anywhere throughout the leaf. And the thing that's the biggest difference between the fungal and the bacterial disease just by appearance is gonna be fungal diseases, again, are radial or somewhat circular, where they radiate out from a central point of infection, whereas these bacterial diseases are a bit more angular in their necrosis. So you can see that these are somewhat isolated and they're somewhat angular, more squarish, rectangular, and that's because these bacteria can't actually punch through the cell walls of the leaf. Whereas fungi will use their hyphae and those cell walls don't constrict their movement within the, the, the leaf tissue. So very basic diagnostic here. If it's a radial pattern of death on your leaf, it's most likely a fungal disease. Whereas if it's kind of very angular and not radiating out, then it's gonna be a bacterial disease. And that way, if you get that diagnosis initially, you'll know how to treat your plant better because fungicides and bactericides are gonna have very different effects. And you wanna know, first of all, what is your pest or disease and then how to treat it appropriately. Um, one thing we do see occasionally when it gets really hot and sunny is something like this and it looks a little bit like a fungal disease but this is actually just sunburn some of the leaves that are particularly sensitive if they get water on the leaf in the middle of the day the water will actually amplify the sun's radiation and will burn the tissue of the leaf it acts like a magnifying glass it right? acts like a magnifying glass and with our intensity of the uv rays out here they get up to extreme 13 is the level that sometimes they get up to 
Um, not only is it going to burn your skin, but it's going to burn your plant tissue. So try to avoid watering in the middle of the day, getting a whole lot of moisture on your leaves, especially the sensitive ones, um, when that sun is really intense. Because you will see actually leaf burning like that. And again, uh, another thing you got to watch out for is applying pesticides in the middle of the day because there's often oils on those pesticides that again will amplify the sun's rays and cause damage to your leaves. So one more thing that a lot of people see in their gardens is going to be this lacy feeding damage here. And the culprit of this, many of you know it well enough, is commonly called the Japanese rose beetle. Um, and it is a feeding beetle that comes out at night. And so it has this really characteristic lacy feeding pattern. Whereas if you see the feeding pattern start on the margin of the leaf and there's larger chunks taken out, it's most likely slug or snail damage. Whereas you're rarely going to see slug or snail damage starting in the middle of the leaf. So the best way to control Japanese rose beetles is actually with just with light. If you have a little solar lantern that you can put out by your plants that get hit really hard, it effectively deters these beetles. Um, or you can go with something like a, a more typical pesticide um, that controls feeding beetles. But a solar light works really well in a lot of cases. So try that first and then go from there. All right, one more pest I'm going to cover here is this black uh, thing that coats the surface of the leaf. It's always on the upper side as opposed to the underside. And what this is, is what we call um, sooty mold. And it's a, actually a type of algae, I believe, that feeds off of the sugars of pest insects. So here you can see that I have the start of a, oh, sorry, there you go, a white fly infestation here. These are the larvae of white flies. And so what they do is they feed on the leaf and they uh, secrete a sugary substance that essentially encourages the growth of this algae on the upper side of the leaf. And so just to be clear, this is not actually a pathogen but it does block the photosynthetic potential of the leaf. So if you can control your pest infestation, in this case, white flies, then you're gonna control the sooty mildew that you see on the top of your leaf. And it's ugly, but again, it is not actually a pathogen. Now, it, I do have that at home on one of my Alahe <laughs> Yeah. So, okay, that's good to know. So exactly. it's not the end of the world. If you do have it, just realize it's we not a pathogen. Okay. Um, is there a way to treat Fusarium? Fusarium? Fusarium. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, any sort of fungicide that you can pick up at your garden store is probably going to work for that. Um, but once your plant is infected with Fusarium, then you're going to want to very carefully eliminate the portions of the plant that are infected. Because if it's a wilt disease, it actually travels through the vascular system of the plant. And so if you see a particular branch or stem of your plant that's infected, you want to clip it down near the base and kind of inspect the tissue inside of the stem and see if it looks healthy or if it looks diseased. Unfortunately, if it's already penetrated into your plant and spread throughout the vascular system, there may not be a whole lot that you can do, mm -hmm. but there are systemic fungicides which will actually travel into the plant um, as opposed to like a contact spray, which actually needs to contact the disease that'll help to control it. But mainly it's about keeping your plant health up and about practicing integrated pest management to hopefully keep your plants from getting the fusarium wilt in the first place. Excellent. Thank you. Great. All right, so we're just going to touch on water quality really quickly here because water, of course, is essential to keep
keeping your plants alive and healthy, right? And it's not just about watering them, but it's about knowing the quality of the water that you're using because water quality certainly does vary depending on where you live and what type of water you're using. Thankfully here in Hawaii, you know, uh, mainly thanks to our, our watersheds and our native forests that help to capture and provide us with this amazing source of drinking water that we have, help to filter it down into our aquifer, um, that we have this amazing quality water here in Hawaii. Mm -hmm. But it still is important that we monitor things like how much total dissolved salts or TDS are in our water. And this is particularly important if you're growing things that are sensitive to salts in the water. So for example, carnivorous plants have evolved in environments that are very poor in nutrients and salts. And so they can't handle a level of salts in our water that we give them more than approximately 200 parts per million wow. total dissolved salts. Is that and why it, in the back of our greenhouse where your, your carnivorous plants are, it says rainwater only. Rainwater only, yeah. exactly. <laughs> and so, um, yeah, here in Hawaii, our rainwater, our, excuse me, our top water generally doesn't go too far above 300 parts per million. But just as a, a reference, rainwater, deionized water, distilled water should be below 50 parts per million. And the EPA limit of safe drinking water should be below 500 parts per million. Wow. And when we're talking about dissolved salts in the water, we're talking about things like sodium, chloride, magnesium. And so at low levels, they're okay for us to drink and they're all right for plants. But at high levels, they can become very toxic, mm -hmm. not only to us, but to our plants. So... We have a large collection of carnivorous plants here in the greenhouse. So it's important for us to monitor the water quality that we're giving these plants. So I have a very basic TDS, again, total dissolved salts meter here. You can pick this up online. It has a nice little digital display. And basically it has two probes in the bottom that are going to measure the quantity of the solution that I'm sticking it into because the more salts that it has, the more electricity that it's going to effectively conduct. So I turn it on. Our first sample here is our rainwater captured off of the roof and filtered down into a catchment. So I'm expecting this to be quite low, hopefully. Look at that, nine parts per million. So that's great. That's really low. That's exactly what we want to keep our carnivorous plants and some of our more sensitive house plants um, healthy. It's a little hard to see the display there. Sorry about that, but it's nine parts per million. Next, we have Brita filtered tap water from up here at Lyon. So I'm just gonna clear this, go back to zero. So let's see how effective is a Brita filter at filtering our water up here. Oh, it turned red. Oh. That may not be good. But nice. we're still below 50 parts per million. 49 parts per million of total dissolved salt. So hey, even just a Brita filter really improves the amount of total dissolved salts in your water. So let's see, without filtering the water, what is the top water up at Lion straight out of the top? <laughs> oh almost double what it was, not quite, 70 parts per million. So actually the water quality up here is really good. Even straight out of the tap, we have very low amounts of total dissolved salts. And then finally, just as one last reference point, I have some tap water from out in Hawaii Kai, which is a bit more of a developed urban area, different water supply, Let's see what the total dissolved salts in Hawaii Kai are like. Oh, whoa, we're whoa. up there. 202 parts per million. 202 parts per million. So again, not at levels that we should really be too concerned about. But if you're giving your carnivorous plants water that has 200 parts per million, 
dissolved salts in it, that salt is going to accumulate in the media over time and eventually become toxic to your plants. So even if our levels are low, if you water a plant with this water uh, over a course of years, those salts will actually accumulate and you'll need to repot that plant um, sooner than you would if you were using higher quality water that have lower total dissolved salts. Is there something you can do to help flush the salts out or anything like that? Or uh, Mainly, you want to use water that doesn't have as much salts in it. So okay. yes, you can flush it with deionized, distilled, or rainwater, mm -hmm. and that will help to flush some of those salts out. But ideally, you just want to repot your plant with some fresh media that has lower levels of salts in it. <laughs> And then um, that'll help it keep it going, keep those salt levels down. One last thing to mention is pH, which is a very important component of both the water uh, as well as the media that you're using to grow your plants because it affects many things, but most importantly, uh, nutrient uptake. And you can pick up, uh, you know, a pretty standard pH meter, pH strips, very in, um, inexpensive and effective at measuring the pH of your media. And what you're looking at is you want your media or your potting soil rather, or your soil in your yard to be at a pH range between 5.5 and seven. Mm -hmm. And if you know the range of pH, it's from zero to 14, right? So something that's on the lower end is very acidic. Something on the higher end is very basic. So we want it kind of right in the middle. 5.5 to 7 pH is going to allow the most amount of nutrients to be up, uptake by your plant. And so pH is very important. If you apply a lot of nutrients into your soil, but your plants are still looking really unhealthy, mm -hmm. you may want to look at your pH and make sure that it's not too high or not too low. Most typically here in Hawaii, very weathered soils, especially red dirt soils, are going to be acidic because they have high levels of iron and aluminum oxides, which make your soil acidic. And so you're going to want to add something um, such as lime, agricultural lime is what they call it, crushed coral, something calcareous that will help to raise that pH level to at least 5.5. Closer to six is probably better. Excellent. Yeah. So for a reference point for any pH, it's usually about water itself is about seven. It's pretty neutral, right? Yeah. And uh, I don't imagine any plants would want to grow in vinegar, which would be more acidic, or in um, soap, which would be more basic, right? Right, exactly. So, so we want that pH around there. Well, Tim, this has been an incredible wealth of information. Awesome. And we've gone way longer than any of our other previous posts, which is totally cool. Um, and I think that there's a lot of really great information as part of that, too, especially for those of us who are at home with our house plants right now, too. Um, however, if you didn't get to ask your question, I'm, we're going to introduce Miles, who is also part of our horticultural team, next week. He's going to be talking about how pu'u ferns, but even more exciting is that the following week, we're going to do um, a horticulture social media takeover. Yeah. And so Tim and Justine and Miles will all be available on social media for about a week just posting what they do in the greenhouse and some of the interesting photos they take and things like that. But of course, if you have any questions, you can always chime in on any of those social media posts. And we will see you all next week, Friday with Miles. So until then, stay tuned. Stay tuned. Aloha. Take care.